That guy was. <laughs> I don't even remember like the specific. That's why I want to know that. Re, I would love for well, you he, to tell the story. Yeah. So well, that was like that was actually I was on a floor. Like that wasn't even in the ER. I was like a medical student, and I happened to, I happened to be the only person that was speaking Spanish or could speak Spanish. And this other team of medical doctors was walking down the hall and went into this guy's room who was Spanish speaking only. And then the head attending like asked the whole team, like, hey, who speaks Spanish? And nobody spoke Spanish. And then this one other medical student's like, hey, Frosty's out there. He speaks Spanish. Meanwhile, like, I'm not Latin. I've like gone out of my way to learn <laughs> Spanish. This is not something I should be punished for. You know, I should be. So they're like, he's like, oh, hey, student Dr. Crosley, come here. Come translate. So I go in this room. And like, there's like 14 people, pharmacy students, medical students, medical residents, surgical residents. And uh, this dude, this Indian like doctor, he's like trying to embarrass me and like just be, and he's like, okay, explain to this guy that we're the medical team in Spanish. I explained it to him and he's like, and explain to him that um, you're going to examine his balls. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? And he's like, you're going to examine his scrotum. And I'm like, Okay, and then my friend looks at me like with a straight face, like takes two gloves off the the wall, and he's like, and I'm, I just look at him, I'm like, okay. So I take two gloves off, and literally, like, I pull this guy's pants down, and his balls, his scrotum <laughs> is like the size of a soccer ball, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, <laughs> like, what do you want me to, what do you want me to do here? <laughs> and he's like, tell the team. I can't do an Indian accent, but he's like, tell the team how many testicles this gentleman has. And I'm like, two? Yeah, he's like, this incorrect. In, you have to do this in Spanish. Dude, in front of everybody. <laughs> and I'm like, craziest. so they like try to like, you know, they try to like demoralize you. And, you know, it's like, it's almost like a hazing thing. And so he's like, no, he has one testicle, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, great. Like, can I go now? I'm not even on your fucking team. Like, I'm not even like, can I, I'm just going to go back and write my fucking notes, you dickhead. That's what you want to say, but you can't say that. And they know you can't say that because you have so much sunk cost into the process. You've killed yourself in college. You spent so much money on college. You went to medical school. You killed yourself by in medical school and you took out all these loans. And so now you're like in the whole half a million dollars. So like they could do whatever they want to you and you'll never resist. They know that. And they're a bunch of fucking nerds that are basically teaching you who probably have fucking wives at home that fucking treat them like pieces of shit and they can't talk like that to their wives. And they come in and they fucking take it out on medical students. So that's pretty much medical education. Damn. Yo, what's good? What's up? How we doing? Chilling, Dr. Judd. Good to see you again, dude. We're yeah, back at it. We're right we got a different, uh, a little different format though, but we still go strong. We go, we go, we go with Zoom. It is unseasonably warm. It's like seventy degrees out every day. I don't know how. It's November. <clears throat> Everybody like on Halloween. It was like I do seventy degrees on Halloween. I don't know if it's global warming, but I'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> wow, that's crazy. November, it's seventy degrees. That's wild. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's. I don't know if it's today. It's. I mean, I was walking around in short sleeves. I don't know if it's seventy, but it's it's warm. It's warm, Trevor. Did you get a pump in though? Is that why you wore in the sleeves? Did you? Oh, yeah, no, you had uh, you had jujitsu, right? I went, yeah, I did jujitsu. Yeah, I, I had to go do some jujitsu. I took a pre workout. I'm all amped up. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Well, what kind of uh, C four Celsius Ghost. Do you, what kind of pre workout do you take? Oh, uh, when, when I. I have rise. I don't know. It's some oh, I've heard good flavored stuff. rise. Yeah, I take one of those and I'm I'm ready to rock. Without it, I'm a mess. I just get choked out the whole entire time. I need that rise. Rise. I'm 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 running around. Um, you know, I'm wrestling around with like you know people 20, 30 years younger than me, and uh, you know, I'm hanging in. That's beast. How does that? Uh, how did you get into it again? I know we talked about this last time, but how did you start? So I started because actually interesting story. I was working in the emergency department as an emergency physician. Like I told you, I'm an emergency physician. And uh, a lot of times in the ER, you'll have patients who are either psychotic or they're on drugs or they're drunk. Um, and they come in and they're violent and it's scary. And you don't have the police or security there to like protect you. 
And I just got myself in a lot of precarious situations, even though I thought I was kind of like a, a tough guy, you know, but like I would, you know, like I've seen people get punched and assaulted by some pretty scary people. And this one time, <laughs> this one time, this, uh, I was at like one of my first jobs in emergency department and there was this little nurse. When I say a little nurse, I mean, it was a male nurse and he was probably like, maybe, I don't know, five, 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 six, like little dude. And this big like biker guy came in and was drunk and like, you know, just being really inappropriate. And uh, the nurse said something to the effect of like, sir, you're going to need to do this or this. And he basically just dropped an F-bomb, dropped an F-bomb. And all of a sudden that male nurse was just like, he more an arm lock. Guy's head was in the stretcher. The nurse is on top, neon belly. He's got his arm in an arm lock. And the guy, this huge, like six foot six biker, is like, <laughs> and he looks back at me, the nurse, and he's like, You like that, Dr. Crosney? And I'm like, Yeah, I, I like that. That's, that's whatever you just did. That's, um, and he's like, Come train with me. I'm like, I'll be there. <laughs> what, a, what a convincing way to get someone to come train. Like, yeah, all right. Yeah, I believe yeah. I believe this works. Like that that was that was that's because it's funny because like they like they, it's so crazy because like administration at different hospitals, they'll treat they'll like teach you to like be like, you know, like, you know, just like be passive. And it's like, dude, fuck that shit. I'm not allowing somebody to fucking hurt me. And then, you know, like I'll fucking protect myself and ask for forgiveness, you know, later. Like, fuck that shit. Like it's, you know, I've, I had one, one ER doctor I know got his fucking jaw broken by some guy recently. He was a big dude too. So yeah, none of that shit's happening to me without a fucking, without, yeah, it's just not happening. So what, what are the, what are the times, like what, what's a specific time where someone was violent and it, there wasn't, it was just you and this person. Like, were there any of those one-on-one -on -one kind of like, oh, this person's crazy. They're on some drugs or they're just. It, they're they're not yeah. able to think rationally and like be like oh yeah. yeah maybe I should chill out they're just like out of their mind but how do those people also find themselves at an ER like they're able to get themselves to an ER but they can't like control their own shit I don't that's I just said no. combo to me what do you see like I, I don't know was there a time where you had to deal with one of these people one on one tons of times so and this ranges from it ranges from somebody being like a uh i don't know an intoxicated uh individual who a lot of times like the the ambulance or the police will pick them up like somebody will be making disturbance out in front of a business they'll call the police the police will come the ambulance will come they'll make them get in the ambulance and then the police are like okay he's in the ambulance go in the hospital and they just show up to the hospital and <clears throat> you know they start making a ruckus and you have to first like you, you're first supposed to verbally you know, like de-escalate the situation, which rare, you know, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. And then if they're really, really, you know, not receptive to verbal de-escalation, then you can use chemical, meaning you get some people to come help you out, hold them down and hit them with a ketamine dart, you know, give them some ketamine or Haldol. We call them a, we call it, a, we call it a, <laughs> there's something called a B-52. <laughs> so we come in with a we come in with a B fifty two bomber. So B fifty two stands for Benadryl for the B, fifty meaning fifty milligrams of Benadryl, and then two of Ativan. So B fifty two. So we hit him with fifty of Ativan. I mean, 50, not fifty of Ativan. Fifty of Benadryl, two of Ativan. Now if that doesn't work. You could hit him with a ketamine dart. If that doesn't work, then you can hit him with uh, physical restraints. But like. Physical restraints are like super uh, like nobody wants to put people in physical restraints because there's been a couple of instances where people have been left alone in physical restraints and they've like somehow hurt themselves, like flipping over a stretcher and ended up straight. I don't know. Crazy shit's happened. So like that's fallen way out of way out of favor. Actually, no, no, I'll give you a good story. Wait, I got to give one for you. <laughs> this is a great one. As if the ketamine dark. <laughs> Wait, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The ketamine dart, yeah. So I okay. So I'll talk about ketamine darts, but this one time, 
this one time I literally got caught. So this guy, there's something called um, DTs, delirium tremens, right? So if somebody like drinks all the time and they stop drinking, they will literally, they'll become delirious. They'll start shaking. They'll be delirious. They'll hallucinate and they will be just not, they're like, it's almost as if they're on drugs. And so they called, I was in the emergency department. They call me up. They're like, hey, we need the emergency department to come up here, emergency physician to come up to the floor because there's this guy and he's like going to other people's rooms. He's really big and scary and he's scaring everybody. And I'm like, okay. So I go up to whatever floor and there's this big dude. And I mean, he's like tattooed up, muscled up, but he's like my age, you know, at the time, maybe like late thirties. He's like jacked. And I could tell like, this is probably somebody I'd be friends with. (laughs) <laughs> and I see him and I'm just like, and he's walking into people's rooms that he shouldn't be walking into. He looks scary. And there's a bunch of little Filipino nurses and the Filipino nurses are like talking in Bagal or whatever they speak. And they're like, you know, and I'm like, okay, where's, okay, he's here. All right, cool. So I literally take, I, I bring in a respiratory therapist with me. So I bring the respiratory therapist up. I'm like, I'm like, come on with me. And I'm like, all right, I bring like an intubation kit. And I go to the guy. I'm like, hey man. I'm like, how's it going? I'm, I'm, he's like, hey man. And I'm like, come here. I'm like, come here. I'm like, he's. I'm like, he's like, yo, you you see? That? He was literally hallucinating. He thought we were like in a club or something. I think he was like, hey, you see those? But I'm like, yeah, come on, come into. I'm gonna we're gonna go hang out in this back room. I sit him down <laughs> and we're just talking. And I go, hey man. I'm like, oh, let me give you something to just chill you out. So I whip out a syringe, a pre-filled syringe full of succinylcholine, which is a paralytic agent. And I just fucking go, hey man. And I fucking just paralyze him. And he just goes oh, out. Oh. And then I literally just take my my laryngoscope, go put it into his throat, take an endotracheal tube, throw it into his throat, and start breathing for him. I put him on a ventilator, and I'm like, all right, we're good here. Put him in the ICU. Bye-bye. Oh, my God. <laughs> Holy yeah. shit. Oh, man. Um, then, uh, yeah, there, I mean, there was, there was this one – there was another – yeah, I mean, there was another hospital called uh, – well, I won't even say the hospital because it's – shouldn't do that, but it was in a precarious part of Miami. And, um, they had, so, um, it was a baker, it was a bake rack receiving facility. That means that all of like the patients who, uh, a baker act is like when somebody is, um, a harm to themselves or a harm to others, uh, the police or the doctors will fill out this thing, putting like a, a hold, like a, a 72 hour hold. They bring them to the emergency department and then we have them like, there's nobody watching them. It's, it's just us. And we have to like, uh, take their blood get a, you know, an x-ray, make sure that there's no medical causes than being crazy. Because the last thing you want to do is be like, oh, that guy's drunk, send him to the psych unit. And then it turns out he was acting crazy because he had tuberculosis or he had a bleed in his head or a tumor in his brain. Right. So we have to first for liability purposes, the, the emergency department physician has to clear them. So we'd have this whole room where like we would clear these patients, but those patients wouldn't get like placed right into the psych unit right away. So they're like 12 hours. They'd all be in this one room and every like six to 12 hours, these like their medications would wear off and they would just start losing their minds and throwing chairs and stuff. And we would have to go in there with like five people tackle them, rip their pants off and then like stick them with a ketamine dart to chill them out. And then, yeah, it was bad. Man. So, yeah. So that's why, I mean, it's scary. Yeah. You know, like, and no, you know, you don't get tra- in medical school. They don't train you for that. They don't train how to like, defend somebody who's swinging at you or tackling you or whatever. So, yeah, that's why I started training martial arts. I started martial arts. It wasn't even like my choice. I was just put in martial arts class by my mom when I was four years old. But cool. it like, it's like the sickest. I don't think it ever, regardless of when someone starts martial arts, they don't, they don't like forget about it. It's like something that sticks with you. So I'm glad that. To see that it's cross paths with your actual work, that it's an interesting. I've never seen martial arts and my actual any work that I've done. Like that would be a quick. That's an unbelievable combination. All the time, and then like I've had, you know, you talk about like you know really scary like people who are on drugs, like big guys and stuff. But you know, sometimes you'll have a you know eighty year old demented man come running out of the room and try to stab you with a, uh, with a pen. And it's like, yeah, it's an eight year old man, but he's still trying to stab you. And that's happened to me. Um, or I've had a lady, uh, punch a nurse. It's like, what am I supposed to do? Just go, um, 
please stop punching the nurse. No, I have to diffuse the situation. So I'm not going to, you know, so I have to humanely, you know, de-escalate the situation. Yeah. Um, so that stuff happens all the time in the emergency department. And then it really sucks too, because usually it's like, you know, you have, you have to be very uh, careful in what you do to diffuse the situation. And I think that things like jujitsu are super important because you're not actually using blunt force. You're using more like arm locks, things to kind of like restrain people, which aren't going to cause permanent damage um, and are very effective, you know, and, and don't, you know, you don't beat people up, you don't bludgeon people like you do in some of the other martial arts, you know, like, so yes. it's, I think jujitsu is probably the most effective for that. Yeah. I'm thinking about getting back into some form of martial arts. Cause I like went to the gym in my hometown and it's been the same complex as my old martial arts studio. So I talked to my instructor, I went by and I was just like, just feel like the need to get in and just kick the fucking bag or some shit. I know that's like, sure. it's, it's very different from jujitsu in the sense. Cause I have another friend who does it of jujitsu and he's been telling me about about it i'm like i think that would be extremely valuable just based on what you said and like what he said he does you don't it's not just purely based on who's the biggest strongest person right so what have you seen yeah. with people who have like insane technique how does that how can like how i've never seen a jujitsu class like how can someone who's small like like 150 pounds take down someone who's like 250 with their technique what is that what is that like? I mean, well, the first thing is to break them down to the ground. So, you know, it, it makes basically every everybody becomes a lot more even once they've they're flat on the ground. And so, um, you know, there's many different like, you know, clinching and, and throwing techniques to bring somebody down to the ground. Um, you know, if you're wearing a gi, that's called judo. If you're not wearing a gi, that's wrestling. Um, and then, but once you're basically broken down to a, the ground, that height difference, um, is less of an advantage to the taller person because you're down on the ground. And then once you're past the person's legs, et cetera, um, it becomes, I mean, there's guys in, uh, my gym or a couple of other places I've trained that, I mean, they, they're way smaller than me and they will just handle me like I'm a little like a mouse, like a, like a, like a tiger hand. I mean, they're just really, really, um, it's really impressive. <clears throat> yeah. I am. I, um, I was humble. So yeah. Wait, so who is someone that you are confident that you could take down that you'd want to, like, it could be a celebrity or anyone <laughs> like who's someone like that. You're like, all right, I'm enough. I'm tired of this guy for whatever reason, honestly, like, I don't even, I'm trying to think for myself who I'd want to like, challenge to i feel like there are people i could take on in the octagon not like real fighters but i'm talking about like you know someone out there from the internet that i find annoying like i feel like i could take them on is there someone out there you would like to yeah i've got a couple you... i've got a i've got a couple old bosses i'd like to strangle <laughs> 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 no but i i don't listen i i don't there's nobody like that i really uh i could just tell you that no i i i don't say what's right well i'm trying to word it correctly but i i don't i don't look to find confrontation but for some reason because of the way that i speak and the way that i i'm just i think um i have an air of a little bit of confidence to me and i think that pisses a lot of people off and so i i feel like i have to train because i've got a very punchable personality <laughs> I mean, like, uh, like, <laughs> like, like a, like a, like some scrap outside of comedians on the loose on a Thursday night at like nine thirty, like that type of situation. Oh, Did you hear about what happened? At no, the... wait. There was another one. No, there, wait. Yeah, I don't well, even know what another fight. I don't know what uh, happened. I've uh, been in like just... six months or like eight months, honestly. Well, it wasn't a comedians on the loose. It was, it, it was at one of our shows, uh, and somebody showed up and was like, really, it's actually really, uh, I can't, I like the guy. I'm not going to say what his name is. He's actually pretty, I didn't know him before that night, but he, <laughs> so this guy showed up, um, and I was hosting the show. I wasn't hosting. I think I was just running it. So I was like timing people. And then like, I see this guy, he's like drunk in the hallway and I'm like, Hey, what's up, man? I'm like, are you here for the show? And he's like, yeah, you know, and then he, I'm like, are you an audience member? Are you a comedian? He's like, yeah, I'm a comedian. I'm like, okay, what's your name? And he gives me his name. And I'm like, oh, okay, like your number, 
you know, eighth in the lineup. You're going to go after this one. And um, I didn't book him. My partner booked him. And so I don't really know a lot of these comedians. And so I not, he, my partner wasn't there. He was away. And uh, so I was like, okay, man. I'm like, you know, you're com- you're you're up after this next person. And he went up and he was fucking hammered. And he was like doing some crowd work and kind of pissing people off and just being just being drunk. And this was what wasn't wasn't working out as well. So he was supposed to get like seven minutes. After five minutes, we lit him because he was just like not doing well and it was making everybody really uncomfortable. So then he like kind of like said something to like us like, oh, you're lighting me now? Like, fuck you guys. And like puts the mic back and like slams the mic back in his hand and walks out. Okay, whatever. Rest shows goes on. Everybody's having a great time. We pull out of that negativity. The show ends. We're literally like thanking people for being there. We're pushing in the chairs, we're fixing the mic, we're, you know, tearing down our stuff. And all of a sudden, through the doors comes that same guy, belligerently screaming, yelling, dropping F- F-bombs, pointing fingers, saying, threatening. I'll kick your, and then like the comedians that we had there, you know, they're all a bunch of young, like 20 year old guys. And they're like, What? And they start doing the f bombs, f bombs, f bombs, and I'm like, "Hey, you guys, like, we're not fighting. Chill out." And this guy wouldn't stop. And I tried to like, just kind of get in the middle of it, you know, be like, "Hey, relax, relax, relax." And he then kind of pushed me and shoved me, and just, I mean, like, I didn't, I, I just, let's just say, I neutralized the situation. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't hurt the guy. Let's just say that I brought him to the ground and put him in a situation where he was, he was like tapping. He's like, I'm like, are you, are you tapping? You're, you're tapping. Okay. I'm like, don't do anything stupid. I'm going to let you up. Don't do anything super. I will hurt you. And he's like, no, it's okay. And then we walked out. I'm like, I'm walking you out. He started lip. I go, dude, don't lip off in front of anybody. And then we walked down the street and I was like, dude, listen, I'm like, I, I'm like, I think you're pretty funny. I'm like, I like you just, I don't like that. You just did that. And he's like, yeah, but those guys all jumped me. I'm like, dude, nobody jumped you. Nobody jumped you at all. I'm the only person that put their hands. I put my hands on you defensively. I'm like, I walked you out of here and I may, I prevented you from getting beaten up by a bunch of guys. Are you hurting somebody else? And I'm like, and, and that's all that happened. And he was like, and then he like went home and he like posted all this crazy shit on the internet uh or um, you know saying like that we he got beat up and all this shit and uh i went back to the club where and like the the other comedians had um they're like oh you want to see the video i'm like get the fuck out of here you have a video and they're like yeah and so thank god the whole thing's on video to demonstrate that like nobody beat him up he was the the aggressor and you know it ended in a neutral manner, nobody got hurt. And, you know, I've seen him since and he's cool. We're all cool and laugh about it. But um, yeah, it was just like unfortunate and just, yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Way to make, way to, that was the cleanest way to handle that with effective takedown technique, no injury. He taps out as ideal (laughs) when someone like he he was like, wait, oh man. He's like, wait, you're that guy from class earlier. Yeah. He's like, wait, that's a sick move. What if he recognized that? He's like, oh, wait, bad respect. I don't judge. Great takedown, dude. He just, yeah, he's he, like, he was, props. <laughs> that would be sick. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that's, that's <laughs> also crazy how everything nowadays is most like, not guaranteed, but like there's a high chance that it could just get recorded. That's what you always have to like take into account yeah. everything you do. Cause like, any sort of situation in a public setting can get recorded. Oh, speaking of stuff like that just goes down and is not like violent or it didn't escalate to violence, but I was outside of a bar in Santa Monica last weekend with my buddies and my buddies wanted to smoke a cig with someone they like met or they just wanted to get a cig. They're like smoking there. And I'm talking to someone on the sidewalk. We're all on the sidewalk, like a public sidewalk outside of a bar. Some people are in line. It's kind of just like hazy or whatever. Nothing going on except smoking, some people smoking cigarettes. And the manager of the bar comes out and like looks at my friend and he's like, hey, like, don't, don't smoke, like stop smoking. And it's like, you can't tell someone to not smoke on a sidewalk. 
He's not blowing right. smoke into the into the door of the bar. He's not right. even by the door. He's like near the right. line on the corner. So yeah. then we all try to go into the bar, and then the the same manager who's telling them not to smoke was like, "Oh, you guys were the ones telling me to fuck off when I said you can't smoke. You can't come in." And oh, then like, man. and then people were like, "Someone should like kick that guy's ass and blah blah." blah. And I'm like, "No, that's just like a bad idea because that at that same bar, the last right. manager was killed by a." customer who got he got into an argument with at that same Holy bar shit. i was like shit just like happens outside of that bar yeah. between management and customers like at that bar you can't calm someone down who's drunk or you can't like it might end up in a fight so how does how how do you deal with drunk people kind of adding on to what i don't about it i don't talk earlier. to i just i yeah i mean you can't really have a it's like trying to negotiate with a five-year-old you can't do it so i just um I do what I have to do in order to get what needs to be done in order to protect them and to protect myself. So, you know, most of the time when people come into the emergency department drunk, we have to hold them for a certain amount of time until they can demonstrate to us that they're not, that they're able to uh, leave uh, safely because, because like it's uh, it's so many crazy ass stories. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wait was the guy i know you told me this like last time the dude who's like balls like inflated to an, like, an absurd size was he drunk when he came in or was he so well that guy was no that guy was in the hospital he was like can you he, explain he was that again floor. can you explain the situation I will. again well, let me let me tell you this other story though because this is it, this is relevant because so this one time so like patients who come in drunk sometimes we'll draw blood alcohol and then let's say it's 400 well your body breaks down you have to like wait till it goes down to like 100 and your body's going to only break down like 30 points an hour so like say if they're they come with a blood alcohol of 400 you have to wait let's see like so three times like you have to wait like nine hours to make sure that their their blood alcohol goes to like a reasonable amount like 100 so a lot of times we don't even send a blood alcohol if we know that they're they're drunk. Um, but this one time I was working at Elmhurst, well, whatever. I was working at this hospital in the ER doing training, and like I got this call. I had to go meet with the director of the ER, and he calls me in, and I thought he I thought I did something good. I like thought, I'm like, oh, the ER director wants to meet me. Like I must be, he must. So and he's like, hey man, um, you remember this patient named so and so? And I'm like have no clue what's the, and he's like yeah he was like this guy and he like uh well anyway he basically eloped from the hospital meaning he left before being discharged and he uh and they found him dead underneath like a a bridge and um they're like uh somebody sent a blood alcohol uh you know they sent like he sent like a they sent a a blood alcohol level on him and um it was like 400 and you know, he like walked out of the, the hospital, like what happened to this guy? And like, dude, it's like, we, we don't like what if we are, we don't, we we can't strap these people to the bed. So if they walk off, like there's just so much we can do. And so you're supposed to like call the police and submit a police report. Well, apparently that didn't happen. Who knows what happened to this guy? I don't think it was because of alcohol, but he was like a homeless guy, I guess, who always like is drunk, but somebody unfortunately sent a blood alcohol level and, you know, he 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 died you know i don't know what what he died of but it didn't look good um and then like he was telling me a story he's like hey man he's like what shit happened to me in my residency he's like i had a guy who literally was drunk he got out of his bed walked across the street in front of the hospital got hit by a car and he's like and i'm and i'm liable for it so it's like fucked up it's like you're not allowed to tie the people down but i'm I can't, what am I supposed to do? Sit in the room with a guy the whole time. And then your mom's just having a fucking heart attack. I can't leave the room to go see your mom because that guy, the drunk guy might leave and get hit by a fucking car out front, but I can't tie the patient down. So it's like, you're just fucked either way. Yeah. What do you, <laughs> that's gnarly. Like there's, that's a catch. What's like a catch 22 basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's frustrating, man. Super <laughs> and frustrating. Now, uh, how about the dude with the huge balls in the ER? 